introducing Clint Burns, of which most of this audience, Dawn, actually met Clint back a couple months ago and went down to Baltimore. And so we'll go around anyway just to refresh his mind, even though he and I had dinner together over at the family house, so we gave him a tour over there, and we reviewed who was going to be here, including a couple others who aren't here. But uh, just by way of refreshing, Susan, why don't you introduce yourself to Clint again? I'm Susan Pinkett. I'm a kidney and pancreas transplant recipient. October 5th, uh, October 7th will be 15 years. Okay. Dawn? Well, I think you got me all, all pat, right? <laughs> we'll introduce up anyway for the sake of the camera. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm Dawn Armenti. I work with the National Transplantation Pregnancy Registry here at Gift of Life Institute in Philadelphia. Bob? <laughs> I'm Bob Kelsher. I've had uh, two kidney transplants. 1992, Sue, my wife, gave me her kidney. It failed in uh, 004, and I was in dialysis. And then 08, our daughter gave me my second transplant. Okay. And Sue? I'm Sue Kelsher, and I'm Bob's first kidney donor. Okay, and I'm Jim Cleese, and I had a heart transplant 19 years ago, so we sort of match up, Clint, between your 19 years and mine. I think we have, do we have a whole body here? We got kidney. We got no, 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 no lung. Uh, <laughs> Kathy couldn't make That's it tonight. <laughs> anyway, with that, Clint, thank you for coming up all the way from Baltimore and uh, share with us your transplant. Thank you. Oh, here we go. I know we, we delayed long enough. Hank would join us. Hank, we're going to see right there. Your timing is absolutely perfect. And so, Hank Gross, introduce yourself to Clint Burns as he's about to introduce himself. Nice to meet you. Hank, introduce yourself and why you're here. Oh, I got a heart in 2008. 2008. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And so, Clint was about to start sharing his background. And, Hank, do you know Dawn? Vince Armetti's wife uh, with the Transplant Pregnancy Registry who's, here. Whose wife? Vince Armetti, who is the What's he, the, the president of, or CEO of, or whatever he is? Lead investigator, at least. Lead investigator of the pregnancy registry. And we have recently moved here to get the blood test. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. She was passing by the door, and we nah. snagged her. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Faith Carlin yeah, works so. with yeah. us, and she, she told me that this was going on tonight. So. Oh. And so and she's here to register Clint, who isn't in the database, but now he is. <laughs> And she's forced to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that, Clint, please, go ahead. Well, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. And thank Jim for inviting me. Um, a couple months ago, I was in Baltimore and spoke to that trio group. It was such a great experience in, in my job at Johns Hopkins. I'm the in-house coordinator at Johns Hopkins for organ and tissue donation. I oversee the donation process at Johns Hopkins. And I also work with Living Legacy Foundation, where I'm an organ recovery coordinator as well. So I'm kind of a shared employee between Living Legacy and Johns Hopkins. My background is an ICU nurse uh, for 11 years in the surgical intensive care unit and also worked a little bit of med surge. And I've been in this role for about 40, over four years now. So it's such an honor to be here. And it's great to speak to other recipients and, and not just staff. So I, I really um, have had such a great time meet, meeting different people and, and, and networking a little bit. But I want to start and click down one slide there, Jim, and these will be on the internet. This is my wife, Jessica. This is my um, oldest son, Jared, and my now middle son, Brady, and we're on vacation um, down in Long Beach Island. And this is one of our favorite places to go. And my son has really long blonde hair. And I said, and he was building the same castle. He was eight or nine years old, and he wrestles year round. So wrestling all over the country, and he's just a big wrestler. So I said, Brady, I said, you have to get your hair cut. We have a wrestling tournament coming up, because if your hair is over your ears, um, the uh, referee will make you wear one of the hairnets. He said, Dad, I can't wear a hairnet. And he kept digging the same castle. Well, I said, Brady, if you don't cut your hair, you're going to have to. He says, over here, he said, Dad, I'm back. I said, well, do you want to wrestle? He said, yeah, I want to wrestle. I said, well, then you got to get your hair cut. He said, Dad, I can't get my hair cut. Every girl on this beach is checking me out. <laughs> he was eight years old. And I was looking at him. I was waiting for him to smile like he was kidding. He's dead serious. <laughs> so my wife and I have decided that he's now going to be 12. Once he has puberty, he's going to implode in a ball of testosterone. And why I share that story is, he, as um, many of you are recipients and many watching this video recipients, I'm just so grateful. To, to be able to share my story, and I had 19 years worth of memories. I'm 19 years out from my liver transplant, 
and that's just one of the great memories that um, my wife and I, and, and just being a dad, and, and it's just been such an incredible, incredible journey. And if we go to the next slide, this is now Jake, who is my eight-month-old twin, and the next slide is his twin brother, Luke. Jake always looks at you like, I don't trust you, and Luke always looks at you like, I'm just glad I ate something. So we can now have eight month old twins. We have four boys. So uh, just so you know, we are done. My wife said <laughs> twins is enough. We won't try the girl. Um, so it's it's just so good to, to have such wonderful children. So um, just a, a little bit of background on how I, I came here is I was born with a very rare liver disease called benign recurrent cholestasis, where my liver disease Say that slowly again. Benign recurrent cholestasis. Okay. So when my liver put out tons of bile, that's what it did, just produced bile at a phenomenal rate. And, and of course, back in, I was born in 69, I'm now 44 years old, but back in the early 70s, transplant wasn't a possibility, and the doctors and physicians back then and things, as you know, diagnostics weren't as good. They told my mom I had liver cancer had a few years to live, but I didn't die, so they said it's not liver cancer. So as we went on, my condition was very strange. It was reoccurring. So I would get sick at age two, get sick at age six. I would have a lot of jaundice, itching very badly. You know, I had to be watched around the clock. I would get sick for a year time, anorexic, just very, very ill. Um, and I, at age 11, it was like clockwork. At age 11, 13, 15, 17, every two years, I would get sick for a year. I had pancreatitis. Um, they, I went to the National Institutes of Health, the Mayo Clinic, all over the country to try different experimental um, medications and different experimental things to try to help with my symptoms to control those. At age 17, transplant was in the background. They thought about it. Of course, that was in the mid-80s when the meds weren't as good. They wanted to try a few other things, so they turned me down to be on the transplant list at age 17. So here I am going back to the Mayo Clinic. At age 19, my condition became completely chronic and never left. But all along the way, of course, you know, um, school, I got through the tutors in ninth grade. I missed ninth grade one year, repeated it, 11th grade tutors. I, I was always so fortunate to have moments in time where I met people with, uh, as devastating as I would feel and as hopeless as I would feel. I always had people like trio groups and mentors where someone would step up, recognize that I needed help. And I, was, I remember at the Mayo Clinic, I was, it was Christmas Day. I was getting um, um, plasmapheresis treatments once a day, every day for three weeks to see if they can control the itching. And a girl said, came up, she was the person that would take me to the test. She said, would you like to come to my house for dinner? She picked me up, took me out of the hospital. I had been there three weeks, took me to her home, took me in, fed me a great dinner, and I got to spend time with her family because my family wasn't there at the time. So it was just different moments in time where people took the time and that kindness, it was so wonderful. And one of my first moments of mentorship and where I saw the importance of mentorship was at Johns Hopkins. I was 12, 13 years old, and what they would do is there was a hallway, and the bathroom was in the hallway. They would fill it full of ice, put me in the ice, and they would numb my skin. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, Hulk Hogan from WWF Wrestling walks by. And of course, I'm 12 years old. I'm a huge wrestling fan. And he walks by the hallway. I said, that's Hulk Hogan. My mom said, what? That's not Hulk Hogan. She walks out. She said, oh my goodness, that's Hulk Hogan. She runs down the hallway, grabs his arm, and says, come into the bathroom with me. <laughs> so she drags him into the bathroom, and he sat there for an hour and a half with me. And I had my babies bathing suit on and I'm packed in ice and of course I'm 13 years old I'm completely mesmerized by Hulk Hogan but he took the time to sit down and he mentored me for that hour and a half and it was a moment I could recall in my mind forever and still do and all along the way I was so fortunate and thank God we live in the time we do 40 years ago none of us here would be alive but we lived in a time where I had the best care people who recognized that I needed help along the way I got to teach me. By age 20, my condition was completely chronic and never went away. I got plasmapheresis once a week, kind of a dialysis for my liver, for four years. 
So I would go back to the hospital. They would do plasma for esosomy. By age 24, this um, was no longer going to be able to keep me alive. I'm terminally ill at this point. And um, fortunately, Johns Hopkins reevaluated me, and I was put on the transplant list at age 24. So at age 24, I now had hope. Before that, of course, there was none. And I'm on the transplant list as time is going by and continuing plasmapheresis. And at home, we had beepers back then, you know, cell phones. So, so I had the beeper, and the beeper went off. And it was a beautiful day. And they say, Clint, we have a liver for you. And of course, it was the most peaceful moment I have had in 25 years. I, you know, and through prayer, and, um, and I just, it was, I remember it was a cloudy, beautiful, sunny day. And I just had this feeling no matter whether I live or I die, I was going to be fine. I'm just so glad that something is happening. And I went to the hospital and woke up 12 hours later in the ICU, and here I am. Uh, and I remember I was the first liver transplant, received no blood products at Hopkins, and I came out with no breathing tube. Came in and I left the hospital in seven days, and I haven't been back since. So it's, it was just um, truly, for me, easy compared to what I had gone through. It was 25 years worth of illness as compared to being in the ICU overnight and in the hospital seven days. It was just an amazing experience with the nurses and, of course, with my family seeing this is, that this has happened. And of course, like everybody else, my first thought was with my donor. And even at age 25, my first thought was with my donor family. And as the, the months went on, as you can imagine, I'm 25 years old. I've been sick for four years. It was like you could peel me off the ceiling. I had so much energy. I was on fire. I went back to school in September, five months, and I uh, got my nursing degree. I got my nursing degree, went to Johns Hopkins, and my first job um, after I got my nursing degree was five years after my transplant on the same floor that I was a patient. So I went back to the med surgery wow. floor. Uh, I interviewed with the same nurses who took care of me. They were interviewing me. I got the job on Johns Hopkins, and it just seemed that's where life had taken me. It had taken me to that moment, and life took me to this floor to take care of transplant recipients. It was just so not a thought. It's just where I should be going. So I ended up working there two years, so on the floor, working with recipients, and also, by default, part of my job description was now mentoring patients. Here I am, I'm a transplant recipient. I'm six years out from a liver transplant. And I'm taking care of newly transplanted patients. So I, I was kind of in training to be a mentor. And um, two years after that, I had left and went to the surgical intensive care unit, taking care of liver, kidney, and pancreas transplants, that's an RN, in the ICU at this point. So a little bit different, much sicker patients and, and um, different family dynamics, but still, more of a mentoring role, but towards families. So what an honor it was, and what amazed me was the willingness of patients to share their journey. And as you know, as recipients, nobody likes to talk more than we do. And so, as you can imagine, it was an easy uh, conversation to strike up with families. So we would, um, I ended up being the role of mentoring families. It was such an, uh, and I grew so much more than they did. I, it was just an amazing growing process. So, um, uh, 10 years later, I'm in the surgical intensive care unit and the job opportunity to work with the Living Legacy Foundation, the Organ Procurement Organization of Maryland, came about. So now I transitioned from the recipient role to the donor side. I'm the in-house coordinator, as I had said, for um, Johns Hopkins. I'm a Hopkins employee, but kind of a shared employee with Living Legacy. And now I am on the donor side. So my role is to support the donation process in all of Hopkins to make sure that the donor families receive the best possible end-of-life care. Whether that be um, making sure that we're maintaining the option of donation for the donors or making sure donations not mentioned too early to the families or just making sure that process going well. But most of my job is going to be this, is lecturing and educating the staff on the process. So along the way, um, and of course, there it is, here I am, um, 19 years later, um, and four children later, and a beautiful wife, and it's just been such an 
incredible journey. But we can't end the discussion without mentioning our donor, my donor, and my donor family, and the most important part of this process and the true heroes of this process. I um, hadn't written my donor family for 18 years. And I've written many times. Six letters I had written, but I never sent the letter. It was just such a hard letter to send. And in my backwards logic, this is what I was saying. I want to do the most with my life I can. So when they finally read this letter, they're going to know that this organ went to somebody who truly is appreciative of the gift they've been given. But of course, it's exactly backwards from what donors families want. They want to hear and know how people are doing. So 18 years later, I'm working for Living Legacy, and Deb LeGrand, who had my job for me for Living Legacy, said I was at a national conference and a donor family was speaking, and I'll just fall in uncontrollably. And she was like, you need to write this letter. So I finally wrote the letter, and she peeled it from my hands, and it took them six weeks to find my donor family, because it had been 18, 18 years, and they forwarded the letter to, um, to my donor family. So I'm sitting at work, and I'm sitting in my uh, chair, and my, my office mate, the person who's in my office in the cubicle next to me, was my transplant coordinator 19 years earlier. She was my transplant coordinator. So now it's great. I mean, we're, we're in an office together. It's just really cool. One of my favorite people, Mary Jo. So over there, I get the phone rings, and I said, hello. Hello, Clint. This is Linda. I said, hi, Linda. And I thought it was somebody else. I said, oh, it's good to hear from you. I thought it was another Linda. She said, oh, do you know who I am? I said, I'm not sure. She said, my husband, Paul, donated his liver to you. And this is the first time at work I had ever heard from my recipient family. So you can imagine, it was Mary Jo, and of course, I couldn't get myself together. <laughs> Mary Jo came over, and uh, she helped me get it together. And kind of a long story short, um, uh, we exchanged letters a few times. And um, I was able to, 18 years later, go to Ocean City and sit down with Linda and say thank you. It really was a moment where I came full circle and I was able to say thank you. And as pro donation as we are, and as, as you can imagine I am, meeting Linda completely changed how I see donation and transplant. I was sitting across from Linda and I said, I don't know how to say thank you, and, and it's just such an honor to meet you. He donated his heart and his kidneys, and I was the first recipient they got to meet, the family I got to meet. And Linda said to me, Clint, as healing as this was for you, imagine what it means for me to admit to meet you. You now have four children. My husband is responsible for that. So I always knew what donation meant to families, but I don't think we can really quantify or qualify. As healing as this is for us, for donor families, it's just an it's amazing, especially in pediatrics what it does for donor families. And having this job and working for donor families, I've really realized and recognized the power of donation and the healing power of donation and how incredible it is for the donor families. We've had, I've had in the, Johns Hopkins has a very large pediatric ICU and we have a few pediatric donors at Johns Hopkins. We'll have families take the donor medal and put it in headstones. We had a, a nine-year-old donor where the, every, all the children were wearing the number seven on a, a baseball jersey for the number of uh, uh, organs he was able to donate, and armbands and donor memorial cards. It's just an amazing process for the donor families. And I've been a nurse 15 years. There is nothing like transplant and donation in medicine. You're taking somebody who has died, and they can save eight lives, and you're taking somebody terminally ill who is now going to be cured. There's nothing like it, and it's just, I'm, I'm so honored uh, to be able to work in transplant and donation, and I'm so grateful and for the willingness for, of everyone that has been so open and shared their stories with me, and it's, I, I've just grown so much, and I have lifelong friends, and in my role now as in-house coordinator, one of my undefined job responsibilities is every time there's a liver transplant, I get an email. So for the last 14 years, I get an email when there's a liver transplant. And one of my job, I guess, you know, it's not written, but one of my um, responsibilities is I go and I meet them. And I say, I'm Clint. Congratulations on your liver transplant. And then the relationship goes from there. So I've been mentoring people for 14 years. 
And it's just been such an incredible, incredible experience. And now being able to meet people in trio, and I unfortunately, after my transplant, had no one to come see me after my transplant who had had a liver transplant. And it would have been such a huge help to see someone doing well after my transplant. So I did miss out on that. And I really have embraced this part of my role. I'm a liver transplant recipient, and by default, I'm able to help people in a, in a different way that other people aren't. And the role that TRIO plays uh, is unbelievable. The role that mentorship for these transplant recipients early on, physicians can't offer this, nurses can't offer this, unless they're in a rare position that they've had a transplant. They just can't offer what we can. And I, I think you guys do an incredible job. And, and I just thank you guys so much for uh, allowing me to be here and speak with you and, and tell you my story. Amazing story it is. <clears throat> Everybody's got such a unique story. And yours certainly is unique from any I've heard. And I've read a lot of books, as I told you before. And that is a very interesting path back from transplant. And the one thing I do want to say is, um, and I was, I was telling the story a little bit, my oldest son's name is Jared Maley Burns. And you guys, Philadelphia stole Dr. Maley from us. He works at Jefferson. And a wonderful surgeon. I named my son after Jared, Dr. Maley. His name is Jared Maley Burns. And uh, after Warren Maley, the liver transplant surgeon, he was a, a fellow at um, Johns Hopkins at the time. And he spent a lot of time at the bedside with me. And he was just such a wonderful surgeon and, and man and I, we had a friendship and and it was I always remember Dr. Maley and it was a way to not only Dr. Maley honor Dr. Maley but to honor Johns Hopkins and the transplant um, program at, at, at Johns Hopkins so it was great. When you get a chance you're going to email me that six minute thing but also send me his name and address and I'll send him a copy of this program I'm sure he'd love to have been okay. here to hear it and that'll be a I'll send it on your behalf. How's that? Uh, well, okay. That'd be great. Questions? I've got a couple, but I don't want to dominate it. So, Susan? I, I just found it interesting that you wrote to your donor family six times. I, I, I did write to them once a, a year out, the day I came home from my first donor recognition ceremony. And then I wrote, wrote to them as you were to yours. I have written about four times that I would look, I wanted to wait a week and read it again. Yes. <laughs> I'd be just right. Um, but I haven't I haven't rewritten. And now you you've given me inspiration because you did yours 17, 18 years out. So And after taking this job time. I recognize of course with their families, they just want to hear a, a simple how are you doing? And it was mm -hmm. And I just didn't know that. I mean, it was, you know, the part of the job that, um, when I was taking this job, was definitely the catalyst for me writing them. When you mentioned that the donor family had not met any other recipients, have they heard from the other recipients? I think they had gotten a letter. From each of them? I, I think it was two. Okay. Maybe the kidney and the heart. Um, I, I'm not, it was close. And we have a fun run at a charity event in Baltimore. And the, my donor family came to this charity event. My whole family got to meet my donor family. So it, was just, it just wasn't me. So we got to have lunch with them. And it was wonderful. And the niece of my donor family now works in the pediatric ICU at Johns Hopkins. So it's great for the other nurses to meet her as well, um, the donor family. So part of that message that I'm hearing is it's never too late to write that letter. Yes. I'm sorry. To mail the letter <laughs> they've written over the years. <laughs> to mail the letter. And maybe the other message for donor families is to realize many a recipient has written you many letters. They just can't get into the mailbox. And I would not recommend waiting 18 years. <laughs> All I can imagine is when they opened the letter up, they thought, it's about time. <laughs> that was my mindset was, wow, it's about time. When I thought of them reading the letter. Do, do, do you think that the, the donors? that meet the recipients are kind of a, a self-selecting group because a lot of us haven't met our donors and haven't gotten responses to our letters. And I was just kind of wondering about that, I think the dynamic is. 
That's a great question. I work very closely with our family services coordinators at Living Legacy Foundation, and it's such an, a unique response from each donor family and from each recipient. But that being said, I would say it's got to be at least, and down at Living Legacy, 90% of the donor families want to hear. Whether they write back or not, the OPO gives them basic information on how the recipient is doing. Um, we have a 55-year-old man who received a kidney transplant. They want to hear that. And as far as time, it's like me. I guess 18 years was just happened to be the right time. And I always recommend if the recipient writes, that's okay if they don't respond. If they may just need a little bit more time. And I even say six months later, write another letter. Um, and that's kind of what our family services coordinators say, is to write another letter. So I don't think it's really a, a selective group. I think it's just a unique situation, and it's a new, uh, you know, kind of a unique response from each. And every, there's nothing cookie cutter about transplant. As a nurse, you take care of a gallbladder operation. This, this, and this happens. As a nurse, you take care of a liver transplant. No, you don't know what's going to happen. And it's the same post transplant for donors and recipients as far as when to write, how to write. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I really don't. But I do say, um, you know, that donor families want to hear. Um, and this is from experience working with donor families. It's interesting because Faith, who's not here with us tonight, had a story. She had been writing to her donor family for a number of years and had not heard back from them. And eventually did, and it was many years. The family had been hiding the letters from the mother of the donor because they were protecting her. And she came across those letters or something and she did want to hear. And so she had her other daughter contact Faith and they then communicated directly and eventually did meet. But I think that a lot of people, because there's so many stories about meeting, say, geez, why haven't I met mine? You know, I'm one of those that haven't. I'm going to guess, and Clint, if you can change this number, go right ahead, that maybe 5% of recipients ever get to meet their donor families. But you hear it in the newspapers, you see the stories on Oprah, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like everybody but you. It's just the opposite, really. And when it happens, and I've heard so many stories in my 19 years uh, that it, it's just God wanted them to meet in some cases, okay? Somebody's driving down the street and realizes that was their donor family. Uh, one of our friends here. Uh, I think I heard that story. Yeah, exactly. And, and it happens in the strangest of ways. I had it happen out of transplant games where a woman was desperately searching for her recipients. And I made the mistake <coughs> of getting involved with her. And she said, I know my recipient's name was Bob. He was from Philadelphia, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, heck, we've got a heart group. I certainly can check the database for you. I'm Mr. Good, do it good, right? Picked up the phone, called the guy that's got the database and said, hey, who, Bob, in such and such a date got a heart transplant in Philadelphia? He said, oh, that must be so-and-so. So I called him and said, you know, your donor's here at the transplant game. Do you want to meet her or talk to her? He said, oh, yeah. And they had communicated by letters at one point in time, so it wasn't totally out of the you know, ballpark. So I put him in touch. Well, she was so overwhelmed that she was sharing with everybody, including our donor family group here, and I got chided pretty strongly after we got back for doing that because you don't do that. Two people want to meet, you know. Hey, I was wrong. And so you got to be really careful with that stuff because you don't know what you're dealing with. And in this case, the woman was right there. She, I knew her, you know, it was a mistake on my part. I'm going to do it again, you know, go through uh, the Gift of Life program. They've got people that coordinate that kind of stuff, but it was an impromptu thing. So it happens in the strangest of ways. It's my point. And I'll, I'll ask our family services coordinator kind of what the data is. So that's a, a great question on the percentage. I'd even like to know kind of what the percentage is. There. And if you click to the almost the last slide, that's my donor, Paul, with his daughter. And my donor, Paul, was at Peninsula Regional Hospital. And he had died of a stroke. And one more slide down. And that is us meeting his wife, Linda. And that's his daughter, Kim. So that was us in Asian City having one. I asked him over dinner, and I thought it was a cute story. You got married after your transplant, yeah. and I asked him, I said, what the heck was your wife thinking getting involved with somebody with a liver transplant? Tell that yeah, story if you, you would. Know, my wife worked in the surgical ICU with me 
Um, so she, she was a nurse and she took care of liver and kidney. She had seen a lot of liver transplants, had a difficult time, and you know, and um, I ended up we ended up being friends for years um, before we ever went out. And I'm thinking, um, you know, she's probably not going to want to go out with a liver transplant recipient, but um, she ended up being okay with it. I think. Um, Did she have access to your records and your blood work. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Just make sure I'm doing okay. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, I, people have uh, uh, misconceptions about how transplant recipients look. If we were all in a group, you couldn't pick us out of a group. So I think sometimes my wife even forgets, you know, that I've had a liver transplant. I'm fortunately very healthy. And, um, you know, when we started going out, it wasn't the number one topic of conversation. And, ended up getting married now. I think you're a good example, and, and this, Hank, you were talking about the select group that we are, and we are a select group because more than just the fact that we're recipients, we're people who come out to these kind of meetings and get to meet others, and you don't realize that's not the norm, okay? There are thousands of transplants done, and people go back into normal lives, but very few get as involved, certainly long term, as Bob and Sue and Susan and others have, okay? And so as a result, it is a select group. There's no question about that we circulate among. And so you think that's the norm. It's not the norm. We're the other 5% up here in a different way. And so my observation would be that the way you carry yourself and the way you relate to other people has a lot to do with how they perceive transplantation. And so if you ever met Clint and you didn't know how to transplant, you'd never guess it. Okay, I have to confess that with my stomach the way it is these days, uh, Ruth Miller and I were at the movies uh, of a transplant movie back when, and we identified who were transplant recipients by that same growth as they were coming down. And we engaged a couple of conversation, we were right. But in general, for people who can maintain their, their uh, sveltness, <laughs> like Clint does, I mean, there's no clues unless you get into conversation and the conversation happens to get there. Well, I, I wanted to say, but your experience, how meaningful that was for me. There's a group in Philadelphia called Sec Second Chance, it, and it's just heart transplant recipients. I was on an LVAD for two years before I got my heart, so they let you into the group if you, if you have an LVAD, and it, it was so meaningful to me to see People like us, like you, it's like I couldn't believe that I was gonna could be normal mm -hmm. again. And, and the same experience even before I got my bad to to see other people with bads, just they had to come and introduce themselves to me on the hospital floor and I mean I I could walk with assistance but I was kind of but you know, after a while, you can walk normally, and, and you look fairly decent. You know, and, and it, it just it 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 does. It gives you a lot of hope mm -hmm. and belief that you're going to make it. Well, it takes me two thoughts. One gets me right back to Clint, but before that, one of the drawbacks of HIPAA is that there's a number of organizations like ourselves, Trio, and Second Chance, who have performed that mentoring function of going in there and providing the look of what the future can be for a candidate. And I think sometimes that's self-fulfilling, okay? The person says, oh, I can look like him? I can live life normally? Ah, oh, they go off and live a normal life. As opposed to somebody else says, well, I'm going to be sick after the transplant this way. I'm going to be an invalid the rest of my life. And they are. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But with the HIPAA, it's not the open floors that we used to be able to go up and associate with patients like we used to, okay? It depends on a social worker or a nurse uh, saying, hey, I know somebody that you ought to meet, and inviting that person up while you're in the hospital, for example. And depending on the transplant, people are in the hospital longer or not uh, in the waiting time frames. So it's a big difference. But Clint, let me take this back to you, because I was very fascinated with what was the job description that you originally had that you were able to use your transplant in this mentoring function at John Hopkins. 
I mean, they didn't hire you as a mentor for patients, did they? Right. It, because when I started on the floors, um, the physicians saw the benefit of it. All right. So you were a nurse on the floor. A nurse on the floor. That happened to have that another have skill. Transplant. So um, taking care of these patients, mentoring, they saw, oh, this is great. So as I went to the ICU, they would call me back to the floors mm -hmm. to talk to the patients. And it just kind of, you know, snowballed into a, a mentorship type role. So did they actually give you a job description? No. no, it was just out of evolution. Okay, because a lot of people watch this and going to say, oh, I want his job. I can do that. Yeah. Yes. Hey, he was a nurse, people. <laughs> Long time nurse first. Working with the patients, yeah. I know him. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it was a great point you had brought up about, about hope and not only speaking to post-transplant patients, but we have Mercy for Livers down by us, and they asked me to speak at that quite often as well. And I think... Um, it, it's just so helpful. It just gives people hope on, on the wait list. I'm glad you brought that up. So, you know, I know the work here is not just for post-transplant patients, but also for people who need a little encouragement. Let me take you back to also a very revealing story about 18 years of having written a letter and not mailing it. Given where we are today, a year later, with some of the things you talked about, what advice would you like to give our recipients who have like Susan, like yourself, and so many others, with all good intentions, afraid to reach out to the donor family. They've tried to express themselves, but it's not perfect yet, so they don't send it, and as a result, communication doesn't happen. What kind of advice would you give them to give the inspiration you just gave Susan, for example? Some of the best advice I ever got was, we're all big boys and big girls. We're all adults. It is their decision whether they open the letter or not. So for us to write the letter, is really what's our intention is to say thank you so when they get the letter it's really up to them they're adults they can make this decision based on where they are and um, that's the advice i get is that we need our intention is to say thank you and hopefully our intention is to help them with hope maybe it might even help them with their grieving process but really is to say thank you and just to recognize that most families do want to hear and that came from the family services coordinators at Living Legacy, the interactions with the families. And, and that's on, kind of on both ends, even the donor families writing to the recipients. Describe that process again, just from if living, if living Legacy does it like they do here. What the donor family receives is not your letter directly, rather it's in another envelope so they know what they're getting into if they open it. Is that so correct? That's exactly right. I wrote the letter and they actually, it's sometimes it's even a phone call to the donor family or it's the form letter, would you like to hear? So it's anonymous and, and they get the letter and say, they'll call living like say, yes, I would like to hear from uh, the letter recipient. Of course, there's no names or identifiers at that point until they receive my letter. So it's, it's done in the same way as it is here. It's completely anonymous. It's either a phone call or, or a form letter saying, would you like to hear from the um, recipient. So there's well, no, they wrote me first, Clint, who would you like to hear from the donor? So there's no surprise, they opened a letter, oh my God, this is my recipient, I, I wasn't prepared for this. And, I, and to be clear, when I was called at work, I had already written the family and I said I would love to eventually meet you, that's how they had my phone number. It was me getting them the uh, information, so I was surprised, maybe because I was at work, but I shouldn't have been too surprised. So how, what? What tipped you off the edge that you finally wrote, that you finally mailed what you wrote? I was at a AOBO conference in Nashville, Tennessee, and had to be a thousand people in the room. And you guys may have seen this couple. It's the husband and wife couple who lost their son, who was the mascot in North Carolina for the college team. They've been on ESPN. It's a pretty well-known family. The transplant was up here in Jersey. Yeah, Ronald. Yeah. Ronald was uh, the guy up in East, up in New Brunswick area. Now I just remember the name. Oh my gosh, I get chills now thinking about it. But I'm sitting in Demogran, who I, I, uh, who had my job as an in-house coordinator before me, and she had known I've been trying to write this letter for years. She worked in the ICU with me as a nurse for ten years, so she knew my story very well and intimately. And when they spoke, I just absolutely couldn't get myself together. I lost it. I had to leave the room. And she looked at me and said, you just need to write the letter. So I, I wrote, I had re rewritten the letter, and she just peeled it from my hands. <laughs> she said, let like, go of the letter. She took it, and she, really being a friend, was the catalyst for, for that. And it was that moment that I recognized that 
um, what it means to donor families to hear from recipients. Have you seen the movie Return to Me? Uh, I don't know. That the heart recipient who has the same issue trying to mail the letter and her sister is sister-in-law, whatever, is trying to help her. And so with the kids at the zoo, uh, she's got the letter, she's going to mail it, she's not going to mail it, she's going to mail it. And it's a very poignant scene of how hard it is to put that written word into the mails. And it's a great way of conveying exactly what we're talking about here. I have to make sure you get a copy well, of that. Well, I, I think that may be part of how hard it is to put the words down on paper because I wanted to say more than it just, hey folks, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to convey something about how how meaningful this this was to me and my family. And we went through a lot of stuff post transplant um, life circumstances as well as health circumstances. And just to, to, to pull things, and I wanted to give them good news. I didn't want to say, oh, this catastrophe happened, or that catastrophe happened. And, and, but it's, it's hard to pull together something positive and meaningful that conveys just how much it means to you. Now, have you, they have different brochures at the OPOs on writing to your donor family and examples of letters that they will even share. And they have a brochure that, that gives you a little outline. It's, small and write in it was very helpful and it's writing to your donor family it just gives you some basic stuff. I, I did I mm -hmm. did get something like that but okay. it felt too basic. <laughs> too basic yeah. And I think um, like you said we think thank you is not enough. And that's that's us. We think thank you is not enough. And it really is. And that's kind of one of the things I have come across with donor families. Thank you to them is huge. And to us, this too. is now, it may not seem enough. Yes. No thank you is worse. Yeah. And right? Yeah. Yeah. They come right down. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> really, yes. And, I, and, and talking to the donor families, just hearing is really is, is what they want. Years ago, working on the editorial board for the National Kidney Foundation's uh, patient new, our, uh, donor family newsletter, this subject comes up every once in a while. And I said, you know what, let me put together an article. I'm going to do a survey of why people don't write. And I made an article out of it. And so I did a survey, and I forget how many responses, but it was it very quickly delved down into about five major reasons why people, as much as they want to write, did not. And it was all with good intentions. And it was a very interesting article. I'll bring it in and share it with you. But it basically came down to, you know, I wanted to be so perfect that I could never get it perfect, for example, was one. And uh, I didn't want to hurt the family, was another. I mean, these were major themes. And then there was a corresponding one because, and I don't know if anybody ever got around to doing this, uh, was why the donor family didn't write. We were talking about why the recipients didn't, and I had all sorts of input from this newsletter survey that people well, I was able to quote. And it was uh, an interesting article. It got condensed down for their newsletter, but I think I still have the original. I have to bring it in. And the other thing I'd like to mention here, just for the sake of our whole audience, is that the organ procurement organizations have family services staff who go out and conduct workshops on this, on how to do it, and give a whole hour-long conversation with patients, uh, recipients, talking about the challenges they face in trying to do that, and giving them those brochures, the guidance, how the process works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anybody that's interested in this, get your organization, your chapter, whoever, to invite one of them in to do that kind of presentation, because it is a very common concern and you're not the only one feeling this, mm -hmm. and you do a real service by bringing and having that talk discussed at a meeting. I think, I gotta think, I, I'm trying to remember whether we have one of these in our TRIO library. I don't think we do. It might be something to have done and capture. We certainly had meetings out, but I don't think we ever recorded one. I've, I've talked at the exact um, seminar before with the family services. It was myself and Michelle, we taught that seminar. It was mm. Exactly what you said. So I know they do here at Gift of Life. They go around to the to the various support groups and they do that anytime they ask. Early most meetings where um, when I was chairing most, of it, it was a meeting with some recipients and some people from Heart to Gold, which is Gift of Life's donor family group. 
made spoke and, and said, why they want to hear, why they don't, what they do, mm -hmm. don't worry about this, I want to hear that, what I'm afraid of. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid of it. I think now I justify it. I, I did write once, and I didn't hear, but mm -hmm. I don't know whether they got it, you know, just because it took me 14 months doesn't mean that they were ready at that point. I, I don't know all that one way to go. I think <clears throat> one of the ways I justify not writing now is I know that all donors is my donor. I don't know my donor, so they're all they're all mine. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of me fears that if I, if I write and I do hear from my donor that I won't have that big family. Big, big, yeah. You know, open arms, you're, you're all my donors. Now, nice. Whether you're before or after mine, because if you weren't going to be a donor family before my donor family did what, what they did, you know, it, the program wouldn't be here. And all, all those donors weren't existing after my transplant. Transplant, you know, I wouldn't have the doctors and the medication to treat me because they're not going to just treat people who stopped being transplanted 15 years ago. Um, so they're all my donors. So it's almost like if I do finally hear from mine, mm -hmm. will I not be that magnanimous? So, Bob, let me ask you if you ever written to your donor family, <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you've taken your donor family on a cruise, even. Many. Many. <laughs> Bob being a living uh, recipient of a living donation from his wife, Sue, of course, is now and in the image daughter. there. We've taken her. Yep. She's been taken in her family. <laughs> I did write, it was put in a magazine or a paper from the Get the Light for our 15th anniversary. Very cool. And uh, I've I come in here and and write it and finally got it polished up. I think you even uh, looked it over. I think I helped to draft it up. Yeah. yeah. At least edit it. Poor editor that I am, Sue, as, as the editor. As long as you would read my scratch. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to mention to Clint that it's, you know, when you, when you get a transplant, you think you're the only person that's ever had one, unless you get involved with a group like this, yeah. that you meet lots of other transplant people, uh, families, and what have you. But, as you know, we do cruise quite frequently, and um, we went on a cruise last summer, and we, Bob and I were in this thing on the cruise ship called the Love and Marriage Game Show. So it's like the newlywed game, but they have different, you know, levels of marriage. And the one couple that was on the stage with us never said anything in the, in the game, or neither did we, about the transplant. So we come down off the elevator when I go into dinner, and my daughter-in-law is down there, and she said, I've invited Perry and Brenda to join us for dinner because their kids were going to the kids' club. So we had two extra seats at the table. So they came in and sat with us at dinner. It turns out Perry was a donor, kidney donor, for his wife, Brenda. So. Again, you go out on a cruise ship and hear, in the middle and of God, or somebody puts you together with these people. Yes. We take a cruise in February. We go to lunch. It's open sitting at lunch, and they just you, they seat you at the table. So we sit down at the table. We go around and introduce ourselves. Well, however comes up, I don't know. Turns out every person at that table had some connection to transplant. The one lady had a kidney transplant, and her and her husband were there. The lady sitting next to me with her two kids, her husband was being tested as a kidney donor for her sister. And of course, with Bob and I. But it's unbelievable. And when you start talking about it, you know, with complete strangers, how many people are out there that, you know, you, you just think you're the only one that's had it, so. I, I know when I was a uh, school candidate, and I was one of those people that, um, what I thought, and I, I, I knew nothing. I, I didn't know anybody who had a transplant, needed a transplant, know anything about it. And I thought, well, I'm going to be one of these sick people now. I, I, I've been a diabetic all my life, but I really lived fairly, fairly well. I didn't have any major issues. Um, I thought, well, now I'm going to be sick. I'm going to be one of these people with tubes coming out of me and in a, probably in a chair and people are going to go, oh, poor Susan. And all that. I mean, that's really what I thought. And then finally the kidney pancreas program had a, a holiday party uh, while I was still you know, on the waiting list. I, they had invited some recipients and other candidates. And I was like, wow. You know, huge, huge difference. Huge moment. Yeah.
Yeah. Dawn, let me take advantage of the fact that you've joined us tonight, and I do appreciate the fact that you were passing by and joined us. But we heard before that you are the wife of Vince Armetti, who is the chief uh, researcher for the National Transplant yes. Registry. Mm -hmm. And Clint, who heard down in our trio meeting that he should be a registrant. Yes. And when we were having dinner before, I said, yeah, you've got to talk to our transplant registry here, and you walked in, I mean, God works in strange ways, but why don't you describe what that database is about, as long as we have an audience here, and you know, why should Clint, the husband, uh, who's got a family now, four kids, mm -hmm. register with your registry, and what does that, <coughs> how, does, how does somebody register, and what does that mean? Well, for like you said, everybody has special stories, and every family has a special story to tell, and the more data that we have about parenthood after transplantation, the better we can help people who are thinking about having a transplant and what their future may hold, um, parents whose children are about to have transplants and will they ever be able to have a normal life, um, somebody who's had a transplant and is thinking about having a family, someone who's already had a family and what will the medications do to my children and the next generations? Will my disease continue through them? Um, so we've been doing this work for 21 years. Maybe this is our 22nd year. And um, we collect data, we, we talk to recipients throughout North America who um, have had pregnancies or fathered pregnancies after transplant. And um, we publish the information um, for both the doctors and nurses and social workers who take care of patients and for recipients to um, be able to ob obtain the most information that they can before they make family planning decisions and before they counsel their patients who are making family planning decisions because no one center has a lot of experience with pregnancy after transplant, especially some of your newer centers who don't have, you know, what Johns Hopkins has, you know, many, many years of recipients in their, um, you know, care. And uh, so we were able to step up to the plate there and, uh, and say, you know, we have 300, um, you know, children born to heart recipients and, and this is how they've done. Is this for living recipients as well? Yes living recipients as well. But right now it's confined to solid organ recipients. Well, one thing that I remember learning, or at least it was an aha moment for me, being that we all try to encourage candidates and, you know, if somebody said, oh, can I have children at transplant? We'd say, well, of course you can. I mean, you know, talk to the National Transplant Registry. Yeah. And I realized, wait a minute, you know, if their reason for transplant was congenital, and it passes on the genes, that's a more complex situation than just, yes, you can. No, the answer is not just, yes, you can. Right, that's my it's point. It's that you have to take all this information and make your decision with your doctor. Yep. And, um, you know, and it has been a tremendous success for a lot of people, but it may not be the right decision for everybody. And that's my point that I want to make for this audience mm -hmm. that's watching this. Mm -hmm. You know, it should be referred to you because there are so many dimensions to this. But yes, right. there's a lot of success stories. Talk to your doctor, talk to the National Transplant Registry to your get doctor, the right information. And, you know, obstetrician and, and just, you know, as much of a team approach as you can get. I mean, I remember hearing some patients say, well, my doctor said I could never have children. And I thought, that's terrible. And I thought, wait a minute, there may be good reason of for that. Course. Exactly. That was my point I want to get on record and we can, here. Okay. And, we can, and we can help you. Uh, you know, we, we have over 35 publications that we can just send out at, at a drop of a hat. And so they can find you on the web? And they can find us on the web, yes. And they would do a Google search on what? Well, we're ntpr.giftoflifeinstitute.org. Ooh, we've got a new uh, address. Yes, we do. And we have an 800 number, 877-955-6877. Dawn, you've done this before. Yes. I mean, this was not prepared at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it for 21 years. Well, I think more they could simply Google National Transplant Registry. Sure. Mm -hmm. Or even Transplant okay. Pregnancy, probably. Yes, you pop up with all those Good. kinds of searches, yes. Keep it simple. Uh -huh. Okay, but they're the number. Thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for joining us tonight. Very important. But since we were getting Clint registered, I thought it was a unique, unique opportunity to uh, put the plug in there for it. 
So thank you for joining us tonight, Dawn. Uh, Clint, going back to you again, how, as you've had these different roles in your life, I talked about them as careers, how has that affected your outlook as a recipient in all different ways? I mean, you covered some of that in what you described, but directly answering that question, how has your roles and what you've seen in those roles affected your outlook as a recipient? Well, I guess in, in, uh, since I'm a nurse in the surgical ICU, it's done a couple things. I guess it, it really hits home with um, how fortunate I am to do well, because not everybody does. And um, I guess also how blessed I am to have the amount of time I have had with my family. And um, so I think, you know, you're just very appreciative for, for every moment. And, and I think we, even with recipients, when they don't do well, it's an opportunity to do well. So I, I, I always say people have a, a misconception, well, if you get a transplant, you're buying time and, <clears throat> and all that. I said, well, I said, the thing about transplantation is it's our only hope. It's not, that's all we have. So whether we do well or whether we have difficulties or it takes longer to get better or in some people pass away after transplant, we all pass away after training. We all pass away after <laughs> If you pass away shortly, <laughs> um, I think um, it's, it was the opportunity to be healthy. And I think it's, you know, um, so I've seen both sides of it. And I think my outlook is to really hope for the best. And, and it's really, I think, Jim, you talk about this a lot. It's our, our perception and our intentions. and and staying positive and, and, you know, I had talked to Jim a little bit earlier. I, when I had my transplant, my goal was to have a family. And I, I had a family, I said, well, i got to reset this goal. My goal is now to see my children graduate high school. Now i got two new children. And I said, well, I, my, before my new children, I said, well, I'd like to see them graduate college. So I keep readjusting my goals in life. So uh, my, my goal now is, I think I'm into grandchildren. <laughs> I need to readjust my goal again. I think my, by the time my twins are in uh, kindergarten, my oldest will be in college. So now I'm, I'm completely, I have readjusted my goals because of you, Jeff. I'm not looking for grand grandchildren. So um, I think I've been fortunate to see all aspects of transplantation and donation. Things that have gone well, things that haven't, on both ends. And, um, and I think it's just such a unique part of medicine and part of life. It's just so unique. There's nothing like it. All right, let me give you another question. It's going to have two dimensions to it, OK? Both your own personal dimension and your observation from the professional side of recipients. What would you say are your secrets, and I put quotes around the word secrets, of success, meaning, meaning not just surviving transplant, mm -hmm. but long-term fulfilled life post-transplant, which is really what I'm talking about as success. I mean, for somebody, a year of additional life could be success. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at people now around this room with long-term post-transplant mm -hmm. life fulfilled. Uh, what would you say are some of the secrets you personally have found, and secondly, that you've seen as best practices around your patients in the environments you've worked in? That, that's, that's a pretty big question. <laughs> so I think Start with yourself. That would be easier. I think for myself, I think that faith brings a big part in my life. Okay. And I think finding, recognizing that life after transplant is it when you first get your transplant i think we have all wondered are we going to live a life with tubes and once we recognize well just like everybody else we can find something we love to do and i think i've been able to kind of put everything in god's hands and kind of ride the wave and say well my job it was why was this so easy getting a job at 
Johns Hopkins on the Met Cert for? Well, it's because exactly what I should be doing. Well, it was pretty easy. Why was this transition to the surgical ICU? Why did that happen? Well, I just went there and it just happened. Same with the OPO and the in-house coordinator. Well, it was something that I, I, I really found life had taken me and I can offer to other people. So I think really staying positive and being in the moment and especially after transplant, you know, people on an LVAD for two years, they may have a difficult time after heart transplant for a year, but do what you can with what you have and then, you know, with the support and the love of your family, hopefully you get to the point where instead of you know, my goals being short term, my goals are a little bit longer term. We just, you know, I think we work with what God has handed us and then, and then God willing, we're able to set our goals a little bit long, more long term. And I think if you added up the years between all of us, between you and I, we're, we've been alive almost 40 years. Let me, throw, two recipients. let me throw two more words on top of your faith and goals and has purpose and passion. Mm -hmm. Put that in your conversation, because I know that those are two key things for you. I think, that, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, when I walk into Living Legacy Foundation, I have never seen a group of people so passionate about what they do. It is, it, when I first started working for Living Legacy Foundation and Charlie Alexander, I thought, is this for real? <laughs> people are this passionate about what they do. You're almost a little skeptical. I was looking at that. It's the same with transplant surgeons at Johns Hopkins. People are very passionate about what you do. And Jen, I'm glad you brought that word into it because. Well, certainly yeah. I can see it knowing Charlie as I do, past president of UNOS, for example, head of the Living Legacy now. He is a person who exudes passion for what he does. And Dawn, it came out from just what you were sharing before, that passion that you have working with your husband for something so purposeful for the world, to make a difference. So I guess making a difference will be another part of the purpose that you found in your life after transplant. Yep, and I think um, really building relationships, you know, that's what really what it comes down to, our intentions when we meet each other. So when I meet the recipients, my fellow recipients, our intention is to really build a relationship and grow together and hopefully support each other and, and when we leave the room, leave each other in a little bit better place. And I think meeting you guys, meeting Jim has definitely um, put me in a little bit better place in life. And I am um, so for Our recipients, the passion. When we first get our transplants, we're ready to, all of us ready to explain, aren't we? Because we're so sick and then all of a sudden we have this energy. It's like you could yeah. It's like peeling us off the ceiling. It took me, I had to really temper um, when I first took the job because I walk in the room on fire and I had to remember, all right, these guys just had a transplant. And I was for a while, I was like, oh God, I got to bring you down. That was a learning experience, so, you know. <laughs> well, I certainly think that you give a living inspirational example of what life can be like. And for each individual, that means something different. But the potential is there. And just like in retirement, so many people sit back and start watching TV and doing nothing mm -hmm. after transplant. Some people do that too. And they die shortly thereafter because without purpose, there's no reason to live. And so I would say that the P's, passion and purpose, on top of what you just said, really convey the message of success that you've seen. and obviously you've seen in the patients that you've mentored over the years and in those environments and that's I've seen it too and I think everybody around this room has seen it because the people here in this room are those that have that passionate purpose and Bob and Sue I mean the relationship that you two share is such a purpose we had a, a an amazing event that just coincidentally happened <clears throat> a year ago our trio chapter went down to a restaurant down in Avon by the Seal of Jersey Shore to have a dinner, celebrate life. And the theme was, what are you going to celebrate? And uh, just coincidentally, when we got there, now, by the way, we were going to a restaurant where the owner has our transplant. So that's on top of the family restaurant. It's a really wonderful place, very warm, and it just makes us all welcome. But anyway, just coincidentally, we had a bunch of books that we gave out to the recipients mainly, say, here, 
here's a gift to give to your whoever. Mm -hmm. And some people had their other half there, like Bob did with Sue, and they each were invited the opportunity to get up and say whatever they want to say about what they were celebrating and a thank you to their caregiver, their partner, whatever. And Bob, I'll never forget because you had, talk about emotions, you had the whole room in tears as you shared your feelings of Sue in front of about 40 people. And we all felt it. And you said it so well that all of us could recognize what we were talking about. And uh, you almost couldn't finish what you were saying because you had such passionate purpose about what you were trying to do there. I think all, I think basically all transplant people have that. Tears are always so close to the surface. <laughs> They're so easy to come out, you know. That's I mean, I, I know I have a problem telling my story, uh, not just the transplant part, but when I was real sick four years ago, uh, not four, ten years ago now. I can uh, I can remember. I'm going to start yeah. you off. I can remember the phone call I got from Sue. Mm -hmm. They said he's got less than 24 hours. And both Pam and I were listening on the phone saying, what are you talking about, Sue? Wow, yeah. well, he's in the hospital. They say he doesn't have 24 hours. And we were blown away and went on down. And here you are, how many years later, yeah. going on cruise after cruise and enjoying Sue's retirement now. Yeah. I mean, you beat the odds again. Well, that's why we call him celebration of life. Absolutely. Cruises, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, I, again, I, I survived it, but I remember nothing of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I... Yeah. We were there. We were there. And uh, we cried with you. How about emotions? Clint, do you find uh, that you are more emotional than you were before? And I'm 24, you weren't very emotional then, maybe, but do you, do you tear up easily? Oh, yeah. The older I get, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, you, know, you watch a movie now, and, you know, you're, what, what it is, you, you know, my kids are looking at me, Dad, why are you crying? <laughs> it's ESPN. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, that kid's getting his wish. I was watching, I think it was, you know, they do a thing on ESPN where the kids get their wish now and they go get, meet their ball, ball team and, they, you know, I'm balling and crying. <laughs> it's great. And I think the one thing, I think all of us would like to say thank you to all the organ procurement organizations. I think. The, oh my gosh, they're the most amazing people I've ever met. So whether it's, you know, Gift of Life or Living Legacy Foundation, just... Hey, you know, that's another idea. I'm just thinking out loud, uh, and I'm saying it so other chapters can hear this too. What a great idea for an event to, uh, as a chapter, come together and figure out some way of coming to the OPO and offering a celebration oh, of thanks. Uh, I can't imagine what it would be, but I mean, if we got creative and thought about it, I bet we'd come up with something really neat that would be impactful to the people that come to work every day and do the things that gave us the life we have for being here. I'm going to take that back to our next meeting. We're going to challenge ourselves to think about how do we do that. That'd be interesting. Uh, I just have to say one thing. When you were talking about the donor medals and stuff, my parents are both deceased. And we're at the cemetery where their ashes are interred, they have a little burial plot across from where my parents are in the bell tower at this particular cemetery. So when we were up there back at Christmas time, I guess it was, I went across the street and walked around just to look at what was over in the other area. And there is a headstone on the ground there. And on the headstone was the donor medal and a picture of the young man who donated, they donated mm -hmm. his organs. And I've never seen it on anything. I mean, I have one myself. I have a couple of them. But there they have it right on his headstone. And I just sat there and said a silent thank you to him. Yeah. Get the tears rolling with that story. Yes. <laughs> and I've never seen it before, like I said, on a, on a grave marker. But then they have his picture on there, too. So it was really a special moment to see that for me. Does anybody else have any other thoughts to share or questions? Or we're talking about long-term transplant success. Anybody like to add their own thoughts on that, given your own success? And the challenges, of course, we face, and overcoming those challenges, and eventually dying, just like everybody else does, you know? But it's between that time and whenever that time comes that is the meaning we have in life. Be that one day, one week, one month, or 19 years. 
just a question out of curiosity. Are, do you participate in the transplant games? I was just talking to you about that. I, I run some triathlons, and I've done Bethany Beach triathlon, things like that. Um, with my family in the amount of time and vacation time, I'm definitely going to do the transplant games for the first time next year. So that's my goal, is to go out and do the transplant games. I'm really excited about it now. Latrice at Living Legacy Foundation, is, you know, she does the Team Maryland, so I'll see you guys out there. Where is it in Texas, Steve? Houston. Houston. Yeah, Houston. 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 So, uh, it's not like across the country. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be hot. <laughs> you're in shape and you're so full of energy. It's like I see you zip. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other thoughts or questions before we close? If not, stay right there, Clint. We have a little token of art. Thank you. I introduced Clint to our chapter's children's book about transplantation, and I promised him, uh, we saw his library over there, but I promised him a copy to take home to his children, and uh, we thank you. And more than that, we also have the butterfly effect, a little token of our impression of how you, like a butterfly, with your sharings, are causing ripple effects around the world, certainly as we have here in Philadelphia tonight. And so, on behalf of the Trio chapter, Thanks. thank you very much. And I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And sharing. Thank you. We're paying it forward. Thank you. I thank you. Right, appreciate thank it very much. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. And so, Clint, just uh, in closing, tell us about that six-minute audio that you're going to send me. So, I just heard the most amazing thing I've ever heard from a donor family, it was a tissue donor, and when tissue donors are consented, it's done over the phone. Um, so Living Legacy will call the, um, the family's tissue consenters and family services coordinators at Living Legacy, and the, there's a six minute audio of one of the most grateful donor families, and it's in real time when she had just consented and what it meant to her, and I'm gonna send it, and they said we're free to use it, um, as we wish, and I would really love for you guys to hear this, but I'll send it to Jim. We had a staff meeting, uh, and it was standing all like that we were all just bawling. It's one of the most incredible audios. It's just audio, um, but it's incredible, and I'll send it to you guys. Speaking of incredible audios, Bob and Sue over here just had an experience recently. Why don't you share with us your recent radio experience? Last Wednesday, we were, went to WMMR Radio, and it's a rock station here in Philadelphia. And we were inter interviewed by Marcus Goldman, who is the public affairs director on organ and tissue, or organ and transplant, organ donation and transplantation. So our son Chuck, uh, who he somehow is in contact all the time with the DJs and what have you at this radio station and he planted the seed into Marcus's thoughts that they do a show on Sunday morning, a public affairs a service kind of show to the community and he planted the seed that for them to interview Bob and I for one of their shows. So we finally got it all together and we decided yes and we had to have a doctor come with us so I, asked, I emailed his kidney doctor at University of Penn if he would come, and his name is Robert uh, Grossman, and he said yes, he would come and be interviewed in, as part of this program. And I got John Green, Director of Community Relations here at Gift of Life, to come. And uh, Marcus did a lot of research prior to the recording of the show. We went to the studio, and we all sat in the room and had to have our voice tested and levels and what have you. And we talked for, I guess we talked about maybe 40 minutes. He cuts it down to less, I think it was 26 minutes of actual broadcast time. And it was really a neat experience. And uh, they're supposed to post it on their website. They're having, he's having some kind of technical difficulties and can't get the blog up on the website yet. But um, he said, I did ask him if he would send me a CD of the show, and he said yes, he would. So I'm hoping that eventually it'll get up on the website so that people can hear it. 
Jim, would you be able to put that on the TRIO website? Or? If they allow it, it's a allow radio it. station. If they willing, we certainly can put the link up there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. The link. Link. So yeah, that's why I've been pushing her to yeah. to try and get it for us. Well, so I've, do, been, I've been emailing him, and I emailed him this morning, and I said, "What's the update on it?" And he said, "It'll be up on there today." And okay. then when I left it, well, when we get it, we'll pass it on. It wasn't up yet, so and we'll get it up on the national website also. So. But it was a really neat experience. He did a lot of research beforehand because he asked the appropriate questions of us. And I was so glad to have John Green come from here because he could give the overall aspect of what is involved and the number of people waiting and what have you. And of course, Dr. Grossman gave the aspect of our transplant because he, he was Bob's nephrologist for both, both of his transplants. And um, our daughter Laura was there too. She was Bob's second donor, and it was just a fun experience. And it was quite, quite interesting to see how things work. And um, you know, I mean, really enjoyed it. So Pierre um, Robert, who is one of the DJs, is very famous from around here. Was in the, uh, the studio next to us, and we're sitting there. We're even at. It <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly, it's a great way to get the message out. And they were looking forward to it. I really did mean to get up at 6 a.m. on Sunday to listen to it, but my body didn't get me up. Yeah, it was on 6, <laughs> yeah, six it was supposed to be on 6 o'clock on one of their sister station, WBEN, and 6.30 on WMMR, but it wasn't on WBEN at 6, but it was on at 6.30 on WMMR. All right, well, get us the link and we'll get it out so everybody can hear it. All right, great. I'm my hands, I'm trying, though. All right, and with that,